Good evening. Thank you for joining us for tonight's lecture. I'm Patrick Lewis, Director of Collections and Research at the Filson Historical Society. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors from the University of Louisville, the Department of History, the Commonwealth Center for the Humanities and Society, the Women's Center, the Department of Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, and Phi Alpha Theta. I will moderate questions after the presentation as time permits. Thank you again for joining us for tonight's lecture, Suffrage, Women's Long Battle for the Vote. To introduce our speaker tonight, I'll hand off the program to Dr. Christine Eric of the University of Louisville. Great. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, it gives me such pleasure to introduce our featured speaker uh, for today. Um, Alan Du Bois and I go back uh, just a couple of years, um, back to when I was a graduate student at UCLA, and she was one of my uh, major professors. Um, I was a Latin Americanist, still am, um, but at that time, um, said a, <clears throat> a few years ago, um, there weren't really too many people in the history department at, U at UCLA who did a lot of work on women's history, which was something that I was interested in. So along with a number of other Latin Americanists, uh, we, we all sort of washed ashore to so to speak on, in, at Ellen's uh, office door and she was generous enough to take us in and um, you know, sort of guide us through what was then a, a, you know, a new and emerging field. Um, things have changed since then. The field of women's and gender history uh, has, has expanded and become much more, less marginal than it was back then. And Ellen is now a professor emeritus of history at UCLA. But even though she is officially retired, she has continued to be very active in publishing in the field. Most important, of course, is the book she will be talking to, talking about with us today. Suffrage, Women's Long Battle for the Vote, which was published in 2020 by Simon & Schuster in honor of the centennial of the 19th Amendment and a definitive history of the long campaign for women's voting rights in the United States. Um, COVID, of course, really disrupted plans for a book tour for this book, uh, including a planned visit to Louisville, which was supposed to have been about a year ago. So we are happy to have her here virtually and look forward to having her back here in person at some point in the future. In addition to that, um, the, the book she's gonna talk about uh, with us today, uh, Ellen has a new edition forthcoming of um, her, uh, of Through Women's Eyes and American History with Documents. This new edition will be co-edited with Brenda Stevenson, another one of my uh, heroines uh, from UCLA. So I'm as excited about that collaboration. And Ellen is also working on a biography of US feminist Elizabeth Cady Stanton. But you did not come here to listen to me. So I am going to, um, once again, thank you all for being here and, um, and uh, help me welcome Ellen Du Bois. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I'm really sorry I can't be there in person in Louisville. For a variety of reasons, I was eager to be there. But one of them is that the great historian, Eleanor Flexner, whose shoulders I stand on, uh, the great historian of suffrage, uh, was from a distinguished Louisville family and uh, was born in Louisville. And uh, uh, the Flexner family is one of the distinguished families of Louisville. Uh, so uh, I, I speak in honor of the memory of uh, Eleanor Flexner. And now I'm gonna go to my screen sharing and I'm gonna begin. So uh, I had the challenge here of covering a lot of American history, 75 years, a quarter, or maybe it's now a fifth of American history in uh, 300 pages, three different generations of women uh, who fought for and finally secured, at least in part, the right to vote and, um, uh, and who had uh, Backstage, who um, had incredible obstacles to face and fortitude in facing them. So uh, I've organized this lecture around what I call four surprises uh, about women's suffrage. And uh, I hope this will be interesting both to those of you who know nothing about the subject and to those of you who know a little bit about the subject. So let us start. 
the first suffrage surprise, uh, which uh, is situated in the years after the Civil War uh, and through the end of the post-Civil War period called Reconstruction, about which we're learning a lot again, uh, I call the woman suffrage constitutional amendment that never was. And this, um, this part of the lecture, I think, is not only an important addition to the history of women's suffrage, but also has major implications for, uh, for the history of American democracy, and especially questions about the right to vote with which we continue to grapple. So let us begin. Um, the story begins in uh, the, uh, the years right before the 1872 presidential election, a really important presidential election, uh, in which hundreds of women all over the country uh, insisted that they had the right to vote and uh, attempted to cast their ballots in the ballot box. As this woman, uh, the famous uh, suffragist Victoria Woodhull uh, was doing in New York City. The most famous of these women who were determined to cast their right to vote for in the 1872 uh, election for representatives and for the president was Susan B. Anthony. Now, this cartoon uh, is uh, captures a lot about her. It is not particularly flattering. She's shown as wearing uh, both, um, she's shown as sort of dressing as both a man and a woman, certainly as Uncle Sam and then uh, as a, uh, a woman, she's uh, she's sort of sour looking, not very attractive. Um, but um, on the election of 1872, November, uh, uh, November something, 1872, November 5th, um, Susan B. Anthony and several of her uh, female friends and relatives went to their local polling place in her hometown of Rochester and uh, brought their ballots to vote and they expected to be turned down and they weren't turned down because the uh, election polling officer who was in charge that day was a Republican. We're talking about a very different Republican party here um, who uh, learned very quickly that Susan B. Anthony was gonna cast her vote for uh, Ulysses S. Grant, his candidate. And so he allowed her to do that. And she was thrilled. She went home, but um, uh, uh, before I uh, say that, let me say a few words about the grounds on which she and all these other women uh, voted. Uh, she spoke to the, um, to the election polling officer and she said, I'm allowed to vote because of the 14th amendment, which was ratified the second of the three uh, reconstruction amendments that was ratified in July of 1868. And she surprised everyone by being allowed to vote. This was her argument. She used the 14th Amendment. Um, she quoted the first part of the 14th Amendment, which is one of the most uh, uh, important parts of the United States Constitution after perhaps the Bill of Rights. It reads, uh, all persons born or naturalized in the United States are subject to the jurisdiction thereof and are citizens of the United States. This was the first time that there had ever been a definition of uh, American citizenship. Um, uh, let's see, back, 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 uh, in, uh, in the Constitution. And then it goes on to say that no state can interfere with the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States or deprive citizens of the United States without due process of the law or equal protection of the laws. Uh, so Anthony and all the other uh, women that uh, tried to vote that, that uh, year um, argued that um, it, it was clear that um, of the privileges and immunities of national citizenship, it was clear that the, 19, that the right to vote was one such privilege and immunity. Uh, who could but uh, disagree with that? What was it, what it mean to be a citizen of the United States and not be able to vote? Two weeks after she happily voted, a, uh, a, a US Marshal came to her door and told her she was under arrest for the crime 
of criminal voting. She was tried in a highly controversial um, uh, um, case uh, in which the uh, judge, who was actually a, a sitting member of the United States Supreme Court, refused to allow the jury to uh, come to a decision and told them that they must find her guilty because there were only two issues. Was she a woman and had she voted? And the fact that she believed she had the right to vote and had not intentionally voted in a criminal fashion was not allowed to be administered. Um, she had wanted desperately to appeal her case to the United States Supreme Court and was not allowed to do so. But Scott, the next one, please. Um, her, uh, it was, um, uh, no, you can skip to the next one. Uh, it was a woman named um, uh, Virginia Minor who had voted, attempted to vote in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, and um, sort of right near you. And um, she brought her case to the Supreme Court. And in 1875, in a very famous case called Minor versus Haperset, Haperset was the name of the um, uh, polling officer who refused to allow her to vote. The court declared that she was right that the 14th Amendment made her a citizen of the United States under equal protection of the laws, but she was wrong in that the right to vote was not a right of citizenship. Um, this is a picture of the Supreme Court in those years, and you will see something pretty obvious about it. About it. Um, it, it was all old, white, somewhat over. Um, overweight men. Um, okay, uh, but the suffragists were not done with their work. Next, uh, next slide. Next one. Yes. Um, two, three years later, Susan B. Anthony, who's seen here on the very edge of the left of the picture, her partner, Elizabeth Stanton, uh, came before the Judiciary Committee of the United States Senate with a proposal for a constitutional amendment in as much as the Supreme Court had said their interpretation of the 14th Amendment would not hold. So she proposed a different amendment. Can you come to the next one, Scott? Um, and this is what I call the constitutional amendment that never was. The right of suffrage in the United States shall be based on citizenship I'm gonna repeat this. This is not the case even to this day. The right of suffrage is not based on national citizenship. I'll come back in a minute. And shall be regulated by Congress and all citizens of the United States, whether native or naturalized shall enjoy this right equally. And then without any distinction whatsoever founded on sex. Now you can probably anticipate that if this were an amendment to the constitution, which it is not, we would be in a much more secure situation when it came to the right of all citizens to vote. Instead, um, co the Congress was uh, unwilling to, um, uh, to uh, uh, advance another constitutional amendment. They finished with the 15th Amendment and it was another 40 years before they intended, whether they, whether they entertained another amendment and another 50 years before they entertained a woman's suffrage amendment. Um, now let us compare to the next one, please. Uh, this is the amendment that um, was, um, uh, that was uh, put forward a few years later and became the 19th amendment. The right of citizens of the United States shall not be denied or abridged by the United States by any state on account of sex. So I've written it this way so you can see that it's basically the 15th amendment which prohibited um, disfranchisement by states on the grounds of race color or previous condition of servitude and replaced that with sex. <clears throat> and then there's a phrase Congress, it's what's called the, ex uh, the execution, the, the, the sentence that allowed for execution. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Um, this, uh, this was first introduced in 1880, and as we all know, this is the wording that was 
finally uh, made its way into the Constitution um, 40 years later uh, in uh, 1920. Uh, so just the next one, please, Scott. I just want to compare the amendment that never was and the amendment that was. The amendment that never was was, was um, written in the affirmative. Citizens have the right to vote. And it was, uh, it was um, uh, attached to national citizenship. The amendment that finally was, uh, was put in the negative. And it was attached to the states. States can't deny the right to vote on account of sex. As um, the Supreme Court uh, allowed, uh, the 15th Amendment, which had the same framework, um, had opened up all kinds of uh, doors to what became the disfranchisement of Black men in the subsequent decades by allowing uh, all kinds of surrogates uh, for uh, race, color, or previous condition of servitude, which allowed the states, the Southern states, um, to, um, uh, to disfranchise Black men. Okay, uh, one more, uh, another, uh, another uh, image, please. One more consequence of the, um, of the amendment that never was being replaced by the amendment that was had to do with race. This is an image taken from about 1910, um, uh, uh, focusing on the, pro the ways that black women were kept away from uh, voting by the constitutional amendment based on uh, the, what became the 19th amendment. <clears throat> um, once it gave up what I called earlier the universal suffrage approach to women's suffrage, the women's suffrage movement, the women's suffrage movement um, uh, uh, abandoned its historical links to the rights of black people, the political and civil rights of the black of black people, uh, and became an increasingly white dominated uh, movement, which was not very um, hospitable. Um, I'm answer, I'll answer your question, Julie, later, um, was not at all hospitable to Black women. Um, because the uh, 19th Amendment, what became the 19th Amendment, was written in such a limited way, it, um, if Black women were prohibited from voting, not because of their sex, but because of their race, uh, the 19th Amendment could do nothing for it. And um, I'll deal with that in the question and answers. Um, i just show you the next image, I think. Just to show you that uh, these pictures of uh, various African-American women suffragists uh, involved in the women's rights movement from the 1850s on to show you that even in the decades towards the end of the 20, 19th century, in which black women were not welcomed into the uh, white dominated suffrage movement. They continued to fight for and work for the rights to vote from uh, their own uh, African-American organizations. And we'll come back to this in a minute. Next. Okay, here's suffrage surprise number two. Um, with the ratification of the 15th amendment, as Elizabeth Stanton put it, the constitutional door was slammed shut and remained so for another, uh, over another three decades, uh, almost four decades. In the late 19th century, the suffrage movement focused on two um, One was, did what we would call in the uh, modern years, growing the base. It worked to include a broader group of women, uh, uh, women uh, uh, much less um, radical and already politicized than Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Stanton. It worked to include them in the right to vote. Uh, and it was successful in doing that, beginning to lay the basis of a much more mass-based suffrage movement by the end of the century. I show you this image, it's from a, a, a ladies journal. Um, 
And uh, I show you this to show you the kind of stereotypical image of the American woman in the um, later part of the 19th century. She was of course white. She was domestic, focused almost entirely on her husband, children and family. You can't see it from this image, but she was um, pious, religious, and very much uh, focused on her home. Here she is living inside of her home. Now, who, um, who was responsible? Next image. Um, it's this organization, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and its leader, uh -huh. who was uh, responsible for um, uh, responsible for uh, uh, expanding the base of the women's suffrage movement. Now, next image. The Women's Christian Temperance Union was, is sort of lingers on in American history as a kind of ridiculous uh, organization of women who went around um, breaking up uh, saloons and uh, uh, denying uh, these men who are actually quite tiny in comparison to this big buxom woman, uh, denying them uh, the uh, right for their um, pitiful little vices, drinking a couple bottles of beer before they had to go home to the old ball and chain. In fact, next image, the WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was the most, the largest and a most influential women's organization by the late 19th century. Um, now, uh, next image, the WCTU, uh, next image, Scott, the WCTU, oh, I think we're skipping an image. Well, I'll talk to you here. Um, the WCTU had begun its work by fighting against the abuse of alcohol. Uh, and, um, the argument here was that, um, men were the ones who uh, drank too much. They used up their entire wage packets, and then they came home and were violent to their women and children. So this made um, the issue of intemperance uh, a kind of a feminist issue, but a limited one. Next image. Uh, the person who, uh, and I think we are skipping an image. The next one. Okay, go back about three images. I think I'm missing one. That's it. No, the, the one there with the woman. Next one. Here. The person, no, one before that. Yeah. The person who, uh, who changed the WCTU was its second president, a woman named Frances Willard. This is her on the left and also on the right. Um, this is my favorite picture of her. It comes from a little uh, book she wrote called How I Learned to Ride the Bicycle. The bicycle was uh, the first way that American women had any freedom of movement. And Frances Willard recognized this. And uh, here, a, a small middle-aged woman, a little bit um, timid about riding a two-wheeler, nonetheless learned how to ride a bike and uh, uh, put this into a little magazine. And it says some, a little uh, book, and it says something about her, her implicit feminism. Next image. Now, how did she deal with suffrage? She dealt with suffrage, uh, not in the way that Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton had dealt with suffrage, who uh, they had argued that uh, women, that, that it was a matter of justice for women to have the same rights as men, uh, that women were equal to men, uh, that for instance, women uh, didn't want to have to pay taxes without um, being able to vote. And all of those issues were either irrelevant or abstract to American women of the uh, sort of of the sort of conventional form that I'm talking about. Instead, Frances Willard argued that women needed the right to vote. Uh, they needed to be able to step outside of their um, domestic sphere in order to protect what was inside of it. She retitled the women's suffrage movement and the term already had sort of a negative association. If you remember that image of Susan B. Anthony, she retitled women's suffrage as the home protection ballot. Women needed the right to vote to protect their homes. I think we'll go to the next image. This cartoon shows that, that here uh, uh, women are shown 
being um, fenced in by, um, by trivial pursuits, uh, gossip and fashion, and looking over the fence past woman's fear to the larger world. The argument here was that women needed to vote not because they were the same as men, but because they had different concerns than men. They, were, they needed the right to vote precisely because they were different from men. Uh, next image. Uh, uh, here is a, a, a very nice cartoon also from the early 20th century adapting the idea of woman as housekeeper to uh, the concerns of uh, public life. Um, here is a, a very uh, uh, um, uh, attractive looking woman. We can see we're already in the 20th century because her skirt's a little short, but she is using, she's digging up the muck of politics, the dirty pool of politics to deal with things like um, white slavery, which we would call trafficking in women, in women. Another issue, which I don't think is shown here, uh, is that, um, let me get over here. Uh, uh, yeah, food adulteration on the left. One of the big issues that brought women into, uh, into the suffrage movement is to try to do things to make milk safer. Uh, milk was adulterated. And um, so they wanted uh, uh, laws that would ensure that milk was uh, ensured to be clean. Um, next image. Um, uh, Frances Willard uh, died quite young uh, in the late 1890s, but this new approach to women's suffrage, which was that um, women needed to vote for things that were of particular importance to them because of their domestic lives, their maternal roles, et cetera. Uh, this was adapted, was kept into the 20th century. So these are uh, images of um, two, um, two uh, issues that were important to 20th century women that led them into the suffrage movement. But now we're talking about a very different kind of woman. We're no longer talking about that woman who lives in a small town, um, sort of inside of her home with her husband and children, um, uh, a Protestant woman. Now we're talking about 20th century American women. They're much less likely to be native born, but now they're immigrants. They're much less likely to be Protestant. Now they're Catholics and Jews. They're much less likely to be wholly domestic. Now they, many of them work outside the home. So these two images are, which are from very famous um, uh, early 20th century, late 19th century, early 20th century um, <coughs> American photographers show on the left, the image that we might call uh, 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 the, Im the, the question of urban conditions for children. Um, so here we have children. This is New York City, as you can tell by the long avenue. Um, and they are playing on the street because they don't have any, um, any playgrounds or any place to play. They're playing on the street next to a dead horse. Uh, so women needed their votes to change the conditions of urban life to make uh, that safe for their children. And then on the right, we see an image which we could all either call uh, an image of women workers uh, uh. or probably um, more um, likely um, an image of girls working, young girls, teenage girls. And the question of child labor was an immensely important uh, question to uh, American women and helped to bring them into the women's suffrage movement so that they could use their votes to change the laws um, uh, to make them prohibit child labor. Okay, next image. <clears throat> now we have uh, the third surprise. Women had the right to vote before the ratification. Many American women had the right to vote before the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Now, as I told you, um, the, um, uh, the constitutional door had slammed shut between the 15th and the 16th Amendments. But also, as I tried to tell you, 
uh, because of the failure of uh, the woman suffrage amendment that never was, um, the constitution continued to limit the right to vote to give it to the control of the states. <clears throat> and therefore in these years before uh, the revival of the uh, uh, amendment, the efforts to win a constitutional amendment, the suffrage movement began to focus on getting women the right to vote at the state level by am amending state constitutions. This picture shows you women voting in, in Wyoming, uh, which uh, became a state in 1890 and brought with it women as voters. So it became the first state uh, to allow women to vote. Next picture. The next picture is of the first state where uh, male voters uh, uh, had to uh, vote on whether to amend their state constitution and give women the right to vote. The year is 1893. Uh, the state is Colorado. And these women who are now voting, uh, and they are able to vote, not just in state elections, but they're able to vote in federal elections. These women, as you can say, can see are immensely proud to be able to be voters. They've got on the biggest hats that they can find. And they are walking with their hands on their hips uh, into their polling place. Now, um, the women of Colorado and then several other states after them, as I said, could vote for president. The women of Colorado voted for president in six elections before the 19th Amendment was passed. Uh, so I want you to skip, I think, the next one. Yes, yeah, skip that. And now we will come to my home state, California, which in 1911 became the sixth of these states to amend its constitution and give women full voting rights all the way up to president of the United States. I'm just gonna say a few words about this uh, campaign in 1911 to get women the right to vote in um, California. This was the first, in many ways, it's 1911, the first modern campaign for women's suffrage. Next image. Um, now the suffrage movement uh, is run by different groups of women. It's staffed by different groups of women. It's staffed by women college graduates. Now there are not a whole lot of college graduates in the United States, but a lot of them, probably more than half or at least half were women. And most of these had graduated from state universities. Uh, so that's the women on the left. And then the women on the right are a growing number of wage earning women. Wa women were something like one quarter of the labor force by uh, the early 20th century. Next image. Uh, the California movement uh, was also uh, racially diverse. On the left is a picture uh, of a woman named Maria de Lopez. <clears throat> who was Spanish speaking. Her family had come from Mexico to, to California, even before California had become a state. <clears throat> She's a very interesting woman. She uh, ends up working at my university while it was still a teacher's college. Uh, and uh, she was highly educated and she works to spread the right to vote to Spanish speaking voters in California. The woman in the middle, uh, Clara Chan Lee uh, is, of course, as you can see, also an owner of an enormously large hat. And um, she uh, w was uh, Chinese American. Now, for a variety of reasons, there were very few naturalized Chinese citizens and no native, almost no native born Chinese American women. There were very few. Uh, and um, so uh, Clara Chan Lee is one of the few of those women, but she's being shown here. Uh, and this is an effort to encourage um, the relatively small but important sector of voting population of Chinese American men to support uh, the California suffrage amendment. And finally, Hetty Blonde Tillman, 
is African American, and uh, she uh, worked out of I think San Jose, San Jose and helped to organize <coughs> the African American suffrage, uh, African American female population. Next image. By this time, by 1911, we're in a pretty much more modern period. And uh, suffragists are using every technological device they can think of. They're driving their cars to small towns, as you can see here on the left, uh, tooting a, a, a horn to bring uh, uh, voters to the town square to vote for women's suffrage on October 10th. There are uh, movies, uh, what are called Nickelodeon movies, uh, 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 sh uh, showing woman suffrage as an as something that uh, men should support. There were also woman suffrage. There were also Nickelodeons that made fun of woman suffrage. Um, and um, uh, so these are uh, the technological devices. And then finally, one last image. Next image, Scott. Yes, thank you. Um, this is a very. Uh, this is the poster that uh, represented the California uh, suffrage campaign of 1911. Uh, you can tell the years because there's not yet a bridge over the Golden Gate. It's just a break uh, in the mountains out to the, Pacific, uh, co out to the Pacific Ocean. But you can see this woman, she has short hair. She's wearing a very uh, fashionable uh, art, uh, Nouveau uh, uh, gown, uh, and she's carrying a sign um, uh, arguing for, and now we have another name for woman suffrage. It's not called woman suffrage anymore, a very old fashioned name. Now it's called Votes for Women. Uh, and um, this was an effort of California suffragists to break out, if you can bring that old image of Susan B. Anthony back up, to break out that image of women's suffrage as old fashioned, asexual, it's all right, not necessary, asexual, uh, unattractive. And instead we have a pretty glamorous modern image of suffragists. Now, the problem with going for votes for women uh, state by state is first of all, it takes an incredible amount of work. And next image, the real problem is there is no way that many states, especially east of the Mississippi, and especially the former Confederate states are ever going to amend their constitutions. They are dead set against letting black women uh, gain the right to vote. So this is the second cartoon. I showed you one that was sort of criticizing white women for keeping black women out of the suffrage movement. This is a cartoon which is criticizing black women for wanting the right to vote, votes for colored ladies, and uh, terrifying uh, white women uh, away from uh, the, um, the campaign. So you see, you see here yet again, another picture of, of women as these black women are again, uh, sort of half dressed in men's clothing, their hats, their shoes. Uh, um, and uh, of course their highly stereotypical uh, faces with giant um, lips. Okay, um, let's see, next image. I think we're gonna stay out of that one. Okay, next one. Um, this image, this is, this is 1914. Next one, please, not the, that one, yeah. Um, this map, uh, which shows those states which give women the right to vote, um, uh, full voting rights, again, for president, um, up to about 1914. And that's really five, 4 million voters. That's a lot of voters. Now you can see all these states are east, I mean, west of the Mississippi. Uh, uh, and so at this point, for a variety of reasons, the suffrage movement uh, begins to go back to attempting to get a constitutional amendment to the United States Constitution. And so this brings us back to um, the United States Constitution and brings us to the, uh, the 19th Amendment. 
Um, before I sort of open up the last surprise, I just want to say a few words about this image. Um, <clears throat> the uh, federal campaign to amend the US Constitution begins in 1913, really literally when Woodrow Wilson is inaugurated, only the second Democratic uh, president since the end of the Civil War. Now, um, suffragists have organized an incredibly elaborate parade. Again, now, if you look carefully, you can see this is Washington, D.C., because there's the Capitol in the back. But um, they're doing this the night before uh, Wilson is inaugurated. Inaugurations took place in March at this point. And this large crowd of men in town, uh, uh, probably Democratic voters, in town for the inauguration, uh, probably a little uh, better for wear, a little liquored up. They are, uh, they are swamping the women's, mar the women's parade uh, and um, uh, really uh, making uh, conditions really dangerous for the suffragists. Um, let's see, I think the next image. Um, next image. Yeah, um, so uh, at this point, uh, we're in about 1914 to 1916, suffragists figure out that maybe they can get these women in all of these Western states who have the right to vote to use their votes to, uh, to pressure the federal government and particularly the president of the United States to support woman suffrage. <laughs> this is a, um, uh, a, a billboard uh, when uh, Woodrow Wilson is running for the second time in 1916. That would have worked except for one problem. Uh, Wilson is running on an issue that's much more compelling to women and suffrage and men as well. And this is the, um, uh, the, um, the, uh, the Great War, the World War I. And he is reelected narrowly and um, so now suffragists have to figure out something else to do. Next images. And this is a part of the story that uh, I think many of you might know. No longer able to appeal to women voters, they now shift to civil disobedience and began, begin um, uh, standing day by day, night by night in front of the White House uh, petitioning President Wilson and embarrassing him to try to get him to support woman suffrage. Uh, Wilson is saying that the United States is going to go to war to protect democracy. And they say, how can he protect democracy if, um, if, uh, if women can't vote? Uh, of course, the United States enters, um, enters, um, uh, the World War in uh, 1917. Uh, next image. By 1918, next one. By 1918, Wilson has given in and supports the right to vote. Uh, and um, now we move to the last of the surprises. I'm sorry I've been so slow, but we'll try to get this done. I call the first one, the woman suffrage amendment that never was, that almost was, and this one I call the woman suffrage amendment that almost wasn't. Because here I want to emphasize how touch and go the last two years of the congressional passage and ratification of the 19th amendment were, so that you don't think that it was a sure bet that women would get their rights to vote inside of the constitution. Okay, um, next image. Um, in 1918, um, in January of 1918, um, the first of the two houses of Congress <coughs> entertain a bill uh, to uh, start the process of ratification. And they pass it through very quickly. Now, if you'll look closely, you'll see that the person standing in the well of the house who was actually introducing the bill is a woman. Her name uh, is, um, uh, I'm, 
I'm going blank and I will get there in a minute. Uh, I am so sorry. One of you will undoubtedly know the answer to this question. Uh, uh, she is a Montana, uh, yeah, Jeanette Rankin, it came to me. She's from Montana and Montana was one of those Western states that uh, in which women could vote and they voted for her and she became um, the first woman to be a member of Congress in 1917, three years before the constitutional amendment was ratified. Next image. Uh, as I said, it gets through the house relatively quickly. Uh, and don't forget, it needs to have two thirds votes of both houses and three quarters of the states. It's a very high bar. Next image. Um, but it turned out it was gonna be much, much, much harder to get uh, the United States Senate to, um, to vote to send the amendment out for ratification. And it took more than a year and a half. Uh, next image. Uh, this was one of the reasons. When I wrote my book, <clears throat> I paid no attention to the 1918 pandemic. And now I have to talk about it. So here are women in 1918 moving around in their various states wearing masks. Um, and on the right are uh, probably army nurses doing the same. Um, nonetheless, suffragists did not, uh, were not uh, uh, held back. They worked hard to defeat two of their uh, opponents, next image of the, uh, <clears throat> Uh, in the Senate and succeeded. And finally, in uh, I think about June of 19, let's see here, next image. Uh, uh, in June of uh, 1920, no, June of 1919, um, they, uh, th the bill goes through the Senate. Now let's look at the next image. Once again, we see a map that looks very similar. Here are uh, eventually the states that uh, ratify the 19th Amendment. It took a long time. It took, I think, something like 15 months to get the amendment ratified. And in the final weeks of the effort to get the amendment ratified, uh, it looked like it was really, again, going to be touch and go. If you look at the white states, and they're white for a reason, these are all the former, many of the former Confederate states. These are states, uh, these were slave states. Uh, and they, as I said before, are not interested in uh, opening the constitutional door to make it easier for women, including black women to vote. And then we have two other states, Vermont and Connecticut. In the end, uh, let's jump to ahead, and I'm almost done here. Next one. In the end, it was the um, border state of Tennessee, uh, your neighbor, um, who, uh, yeah, we should look at Kentucky here. Yeah, uh, yeah, Kentucky voted to ratify. Um, it was Tennessee that became uh, the 36th state to enfranchise women. Uh, it, it did so in August of 1920. And next image, uh, this is the hero of the Tennessee ratification. This good looking fellow was a 24 year old member, Republican member of the Tennessee legislature. Uh, the legend, and it wasn't a legend, has it that his mother, if you look carefully on the left, you will see um, uh, her letter to him in which she says, don't forget, sort of midway on the right-hand side, don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Thomas Cat with her rats ratification. Uh, and he voted in fact for ratification, much to the surprise of many of his legislative colleagues. Uh, there was a lot of pressure on him to reverse his vote and he refer refused, he held to the vote. And um, that gave uh, uh, the women of the United States, of the states where women didn't have the right to vote, a very limited time from August into, to November to register to vote. And um, 
they did so next image. And um, uh, uh, here is uh, uh, newspaper coverage from August 26, 1920, women gaining ratification. Next image. Here are women uh, registering for vote to vote and voting uh, in November of 1920. So that ends um, my story for now. I think I have a tiny little bit of time. I'm so sorry for my uh, screw up. And um, uh, I'm gonna ask um, my friends here at Louisville to tell me what questions I've got to answer. Well, thank you so much for uh, for that really deep and long look at uh, at the, the coming of the amendment. Uh, I know we really appreciated that. And we've had some great questions. I wanted to go back to some of the very earliest uh, parts of your your lecture, where you know there there seemed to be, especially before the Civil War, this this union between uh, radical abolitionists, those who sought racial equality, and then also gender equality. But that 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 seems to fall apart um, during Reconstruction. And we could talk about some of the reasons why that coalition comes apart. Well, uh, yes, this is an aspect of suffrage history that's gotten lots of attention in this last year as the suffrage centennial and Black Lives Matter have coincided. Um, the uh, the um, union between uh, Black equality and women's rights holds until the 15th Amendment is submitted for ratification in uh, 1869. And um, at that point, uh, the, the, the coalition breaks open. Suffragists split. Some say, uh, everyone realizes that the 15th Amendment leaves out women. It prohibits disfranchisement by race, color, and previous condition of servitude. Suffragists had hoped it would include the word sex. It did not. One wing of the suffrage movement says, let us wait, it'll be our turn next. Another wing of the suffrage movement says, this is it. Once black men, once the Republican party can count on black men's votes, there will be no more political reasons for uh, any constitutional amendments. <clears throat> and I have to say they were right. Now to that, I would add that um, there's a lot of anger on in the second category of women, those who felt the 15th Amendment had betrayed them, none more so than Elizabeth Stanton. Uh, and um, uh, she, um, she uh, how shall I put this? She has a kind of underlying elitist, racist and nativist tendency which is kept under control for the most part, but which breaks open in this point. And she um, is she uses language. She's probably trying to appeal to uh, legislators and she uses language uh, about uh, racist language that is very disturbing. It's not like she uses the N word, but she talks about um, how, how bad it is for the constitution to let in, she calls them the sons of boot blacks, and she has other laborers, agricultural workers, and leaves out res uh, highly respectable, educated women, the daughters of, as she says, uh, Jefferson and Hamilton. Um, and this leads to a uh, really contentious argument between Stanton and Anthony on one side and Frederick Douglass on the other. Um, it's a very famous episode. I have to say two things about this. First of all, once the 15th Amendment is ratified, um, uh, that is for the most part water under the bridge and Douglass, Stanton and Anthony uh, re, re, uh, regain their agreements and are friends for the rest of their lives. Second thing I wanna say is that it's not quite right to put Stanton and Anthony in the same category, although they're both angry about the, 19, uh, the 15th amendment. Anthony is much more an abolitionist in her bones. And for the, all the way for the rest of her career, even when she takes a highly pragmatic attitude towards uh, um, uh, recruiting white women and uh, leaving black women out of the suffrage movement. She 
always, every place she goes, including in places like Atlanta, um, she goes and she makes sure she visits in black churches and black societies. She keeps up her relationships to black women. Um, and um, in her hometown of Rochester, in the, uh, in the uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church, the black church in Rochester, there is a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a window, a, a stained glass window dedicated to Anthony. So I do think, whereas Stanton's um, uh, attachment to abolition is, is much thinner than Anthony's. <clears throat> um, I guess the other thing I would say is that it's a very long movement. Both of these women are dead by the early 20th century. Uh, by then, the United States is in a period that we call the Jim Crow period. And there are other, there's other generations of women, none of whom come through the abolitionist movement, who have none of the, uh, let us say, uh, gracefully, none of the ambivalence that Stanton has and are uh, just completely uninterested in Black women. And it's interesting that these women, I'm thinking particularly of both Carrie Chapman Catt and Alice Paul, <clears throat> Uh, are uh, uh, subjected to a lot less criticism than Stanton and Anthony for reasons that I'm going to have to solve when I write my biography. That's really fascinating. And I, I, want, I did want to tie sort of into that in our last question tonight. Uh, I really appreciate it. I know we've had some comments in the chat about I know you tied the, the base broadening to these sorts of progressive causes like prohibition and temperance and uh, food adulteration, child labor, et cetera. Did some of the, the, the things that, that we might negatively associate with the progressive era, like social Darwinism or, uh, or uh, you know, um, eugenics, did, did those things have a, have a role in the, the push for women's suffrage as well? Well, social Darwin, they're different. Social Darwinism is an intellectual tradition. And um, I think in the, um, in the 1880s, and so Stanton is very interested in <coughs> social Darwinism, not, uh, not of, the, uh, uh, of, the, of the more severe character that we think of. Um, um, uh, now, when it comes to eugenics, um, if we wanna find the uh, interference of eugenics in the women's rights tradition, we have to go forward a few years to the birth control movement. And that's when eugenics is relevant. It's not particularly relevant to um, the suffrage movement, which, which isn't focused on women's bodies in the same kind of way. I'm so sorry, I would love to have more questions. Let me answer one other, suffragette and suffragist. Can I? Please. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, the, the larger word is suffragist. Any woman who supports the right to vote is a suffragist. The term suffragette is developed in England in about 1905 or something like that. And it is meant as a, a put down. It's meant to trivialize supporters of women's suffrage. But suffragists in England and then in the United States do what other uh, uh, progressive activists do when, when a word is used against them, a word like queer or uh, let's take queer, queer is a good example, uh, or um, yeah, queer. And then they, they take the word and they use it and they deprive it by embracing it. Think about the, word, the way the word queer is used. By embracing it, they, they empty it of the kind of power it has to embarrass them. And that's what happens with suffragette. Absolutely, that's, that's really fantastic. Well, I know, um, as, a, as an editor of Filson Publications uh, in the past year as we've been publishing so much on women's suffrage, I have had to be very careful with usage of those two words and query lots of you're authors about only, which one do we mean here in this context. Patrick, you're not the only person who has this problem. I'm, uh, it's my first question. Thanks to all of our audiences, both on Zoom and on Facebook Live tonight. Um, we really do appreciate it. Everyone have a great night. Thank you very much.